Welcome to the Living Word, the teaching ministry of Pastor Fisayo Adeniyi, lead pastor of the Ransomed House Lagos. Get ready for enlightenment, encounter, and impartations by the Word. Be blessed as you listen. Exodus 18, 16 to 19. So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land so that it may become lies throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth. And it became lies on man and beast. Now listen to this. All the dust of the land became lies throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, the magicians so walked with their enchantments to bring forth lies but they could not. So there were lies on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Look at anyone and say, this is the finger of God. How did they come to that conclusion? Because they couldn't do it. So they said, this can only be by the hand of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not eat them, just like the Lord had said. Today, for a few minutes, I'm going to be speaking on the signature of God. The signature of God. I believe that we all have signatures, right? Um, I remember the first time they said, I need to, I need to sign something. I, was in sec- I think I was in secondary school. It was GSS 3. wanted to write GSSC exam, and they said, you need to sign. So, boys started doing signatures, and we started forming signatures, constructing things. How many of you are still using what you used in GSS 3? You people are not going to change. <laughs> That's people you know that they are not liable to change. <laughs> Glory to God. Wow. I mean, I... If I even see that signature, it was a construction. I could never have used it again. Glory to God. He had numbers, he had figures and everything. But today we want to look at the signature of God. Father, thank you because the entrance of the word give light, give understanding under the simple. As simple folks, we come today to learn at your feet. I make my tongue the pen of a ready writer. Daddy, I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, make us better people. Let us walk according to your counsel and purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can have your seat even in God's presence. Amen. One of the most popular scams in the world today, and you will find everywhere, is what you call signature forgery. It's one of the most popular, it's one of the most uh, dangerous, and it's one of the most awesome. Now, look at the screen. I want to start by you looking at the screen. Look at that guy. Now, that's an army general, right? Is that so? Uh, That's that's, that's a Nigerian uniform. Uh, Am I I speaking? All right, that's an army general. Uh, his name, by the way, is um, Abiodunbolaniwa. Uh, what you see actually is a scam because that's a fake army general. That is not a general, actually. But he was wearing everything. He was actually, he forged the signature of the president of Nigeria, uh, President Buhari, and forged the signature of the former president of Basanjo. And he has, when he moves in the streets, he had uh, an escort. Uh, like a proper army general. In fact, the scam that he did, the last scam was that he said that they were going to make him the chief of army staff. Uh, And then he scammed one person for 280 million naira. Now that's that's forgery. That's not, that's nothing real. Uh, That's make believe. Um, People can believe that and fall for that. And so there are a lot of scams that goes with signature and that's very real. Now what is a signature? It's a person name written in a distinctive way. Um, it's, it's, it's your mark. It's how you want to be known. It's your form of identification. Therefore, if you have a check, one of the things I, I was dreaming of when I was growing up was to have a check. All right? I didn't know that finance world would have grown this, this good. Um, one of the things I felt like riches, a sign of riches, is to begin to cut check for people. and say, I, I need thank you, then you sign and cut the check because that was red wealth doing our father's days. I mean, when my dad signs a check and cuts it, and then gives him man, I feel like, wow, one day I'll be cutting check. But, but uh, technology means that I've been sending money via transfer. And so I have, I mean, we received, a, we had a bunch of check in our house and I was telling myself that one day, just for the purpose of signing, 
I'm going to give somebody a check to go and receive. I, I might have tried. I'll tell you that my transfer is not working because I, I just want to fulfill that thing of that dream of I cut check. Uh, I don't know whether you grew up when checks were cut by our parents and it, it was a signature. It was a sign even of wealth. You know, many people have signature perfumes. Um, when they come, you know they are there. I remember a while, in fact, everyone has an odor. Everyone has um, a smell. Don't let's use the word odor. Everyone has a smell. So that if you are not in a place, um, people would know that you are there or you have been there. Why? Because of your, um, the, the, the odor, the fragrance that you carry. I remember one time I was in a room and it was not lit and, and somebody was calling my name and I was wondering, how did you know I was here? But he said, I could smell you. You are here. And so I started calling your name. And um, so there are things that shows that you are in a place. Uh, every one of us has a, has a fragrance, uh, has, has a fragrance about us. Uh, and that's very key. Uh, and so want to look at the everlasting signature of God. What are the divine proofs of God? Because there are a lot of scammers right now, a lot of scammers that make you think, God, it's, uh, it's God in the place, it's God in the work, it's God in the life. Uh, but actually what they carry, it's actually the forgery of God. Like that army general, it's not really uh, uh, God, but it looks, smells and feels like God, but it's actually not God. We live in a world where there are many acts and many wonders. Uh, signs and miracles are one of the telling acts uh, even of the supernatural. And that's what you use as the signature of God. Hello. Uh, when, when there are moves in a place, people falling down. Uh, when somebody says, Pastor, have you healed? People kind of think uh, that, 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 that that's a signature of God. Uh, allow me to say to you that I, I was watching satellite TV one day. If you, are, if you have satellite TV in your house that is not DSTV, you have what we call free to hear. Then you would also have a lot of free gospels in your home. I mean, and then you will see a lot of African bishops, pastors, and prophets. I remember one day, one would they started talking about Jesus, uh, and I started laughing. I mean, ah, uh, 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 and after a while, he stopped preaching, and then he started. And then it was like drama. People started falling down like facts of God. And then he said, Oh, that name. And I was wondering, No, there's no name here. There's no presence here. This is scam. There is nothing God here. Even though people were falling, even though it seems to me that there were signs around the place, uh, but there was not God even in that place. Allow me to say to you that signs and wonders are not of God alone. Supernatural is not just the way you know that God is in a place. Am I going too fast? All right. Um, uh, let me prove that to you even in your culture. There's something called the God of, there's a God of Sango, a God called Sango, and they believe that he's a God of thunder and a God of fire. Uh, Amadio, I think, is fire and all of that. Uh, don't fool yourself. Those gods actually respond by thunders and fire. Uh, don't think they were just boboing people. There was no bobo uh, video making this period. It's, it was actually very real. And um, it's, it's a sign because that's supernatural. You, you can't create thunder right now. I mean, can you, you can't make thunder strike. So if somebody can make thunder strike or if a thing can make thunder strike, then that thing must have a, a kind of power. Uh, but that does not mean that that power is of God. Folks, I, I just want to say to you that miracles can be performed by the devil. That signs can be performed by the, by the devil. That every supernatural event does not have a source in God. Everything you see that is supernatural, that you cannot explain by the natural, it's not every one of them that has a source in God. Some have their source in devils and demons. And that's partly the lesson we read today. Uh, before you say, uh, that I, I want to show you some scriptures here. All right. That's part of the lessons, we, uh, the text we read today, Exodus chapter 8. You see, if you begin to read the book of Exodus, it was about God wanting to deliver, deliver his people. And God told Moses that he would do certain signs and miracles. Are, are you following me? And it was those signs that would prove to Israel, uh, to Egypt, that God was with Israel. And the first thing he did was that he, taught, he, he, he went to Pharaoh and then he put his rod down. And his rod beca he became snake. Do you know that the magicians did the same? They put their rod down. That was supernatural. I mean, if a prophet comes today, even in our country or in Africa, and they put a rod down and become snake, and then picks it up by the tail, and say, God says, I should do this. People will follow him. Because that's a sign. Actually, God told Moses to do that. But they did the same. But the difference was that scripture says that Moses' um, snakes swallowed their own. There were ten plagues by which God showed himself as powerful in Israel. Uh, if to Israel to deliver them from Egypt. Ten plagues. The turning of water of Nile, it turned into blood. But do you know the magicians did the same? I began to wonder if you are the king, Pharaoh, and then somebody is threatening you. 
He turned the water of now, which is your sustainers, and turned it to blood. And your magicians could not reverse it. All they can show you again is to give you more blood. So what, what are you going to do with blood? But that tells you that these, these devils and demons have power also. Are you following what I'm saying? They could do the same thing also. The Bible says, Moses, God replied him, second plague, God told him, frogs will come out from the land, from the waters. And there were a lot of frogs, and they did the same also. Trying to say to Pharaoh, don't let them go. There's nothing he's doing that's supernatural. We also can do it. But the Bible says when it when he made night and light to come out of people, they couldn't do it. That's when they now said, wow, <laughs> this is but the finger, the finger of God. Do you remember the battle of the, of the girls when Elijah called, Elijah called for fire? You know, they tried doing this. Actually, the Baal, one of the things Baal was known for is fire. So he was actually fighting them in their own turf. They were supposed to be good at calling down fire, but they could not. That tells you that miracles and supernatural events are not only God's domain. So you cannot sign and say this signature is God's because they also perform miracles. So today, what do I want to do? If I have said that you cannot use only the supernatural, to say this is the signature of God, I want to put the marker down for you and make it very clear. I want you to be able to know that there is the finger of God. These are things that when you see them in a life, you see them in a space, you see them in a place, then you know God is there. Then you know this is God at work. The devil cannot do it. He is not, he is not, he is not wired that way. He cannot make those things happen. He is not that kind of a devil. If I can use that word, God, but I don't want to use that word. So, if you want to know God, there are certain things you must, if you want to know the signature of God, you must understand God. Because, you know, many people have also said, because something strange happened. I remember I was here yesterday, and some of our guys were also here, and, and they came back, uh, they went for evangelism, and came back with this discussion about um, evil happening to people, maybe young people dying, and what is responsible for all of that. I want to say to you that there is nothing evil that has a source in God. Nothing evil has a source in God. You know, there is a way people teach and preach and make it sound like it was God that, that actually signed that thing to make it happen. But there is nothing evil that has a source in God. Um, so, how does what, what is the source of wickedness? The source of wickedness, number one, is the devil. I'm not going to teach it, but the first one is the devil. The second one is our fallen world. We live in a fallen world. We live, and that's why sickness is in the world. Infirmity is in the world. The third thing is that we are our own enemies. I, I can't explain that to you better than saying that if you keep, if you keep taking alcohol and then you keep, you keep spicing it up with marijuana, your kidney may fail. You might become born again five years after that time, but your kidney has failed. So you will need a miracle. A miracle of God actually changing your kidney or you are going to die young. So you can say, ah, the devil took him at his prime. No, he has set his death in motion 15 years before that time. Decisions. Are you following what I'm saying? Allow me to say to you in this sermon that I want to talk about the understanding of God. That's the intention. I want you to understand God better. And I think it's appropriate we understand God. Because if you don't understand God, they will tell you that that is God and they will, they, they, there's no God there. People will die and they will say, It's God. Yoruba says, That means it is the doing of God. So you now come and preach and you are hooping and say God is good. And the person is saying, I don't understand what you are saying. The same God that you say is the one that caused it. That evil. It is not so. We want to look at the signature of God. We want to come to an understanding of God. The Bible says in Psalms 103 and then verse 7. Scripture made it clear. The Bible says, He made known His ways to Moses. His act to the children of Israel. So there was the hand of God. That was what Israel knew. But the ways of God, how is it that God operates? Moses understood that. 103, 7 says that. Philippians chapter 3 and then verse 10. He said that I may know him. Paul was praying. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That I may know him. He understood that knowing God is something that is important in your work with God. Little wonder prophet Josiah said in Isaiah chapter 6 and then verse 3. Scripture says, then shall you know him if you follow to know the Lord. 
There is a knowing that is in God. And that's why you came to church to run some house uh, so that you can get to know a side and a portion of God uh, even this morning. Uh, may your eyes of understanding be enlightened uh, that you may know Ephesians chapter 1 uh, and then verse 17. Uh, Paul was praying, said that the Lord uh, of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him uh, that you may know. So revelation is given so that you can know, so that you can come to knowledge. Light is given so that you can come to knowledge, the knowledge of God. You don't get moved, persuaded by every wind of doctrine. Why? Because you are established in Christ. The truth that is in Christ Jesus. Listen, nobody can run the Christian race without knowledge. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 3, the Bible says, And God is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. He is the God of knowledge. You must know him. It's not enough to say I've been born again for years. You must grow in knowledge. You must grow in the knowledge of him because knowledge is the key to maturity. That was what Apostle Peter was writing about. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. He said, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow out in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Understand the ways of God is a proof of maturity. Christians are ever faced with problems. What is God saying? What is God doing? How do I know God is at work? How do I differentiate the works of God from the works of the devil? What are the everlasting signatures of God? I don't want to be a victim of scam. Forgery. I remember one time, a lady came to me and said to me, they said, I, 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 before I would get married, because, I mean, she was in her thirties, And she said, my mother said I need to see a prophet. And then the pressure was so much so she came in. And she went to see the prophet. Glory to God. And, and then the prophet said to her that she would have to go and buy sponge and, and then they would have to take a boat in a river. And she was talking to me. And I said, eh, when you now take that boat, what happened? He said, the man would come. I said, if the man comes, it's mommy water that came. Why? Because you, 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 there, there is no relevance. There is no co co correlation. I didn't find that in scriptures. There's no basis, no foundation for what you are saying. Listen, there must be that foundation must be in the knowledge of the truth of God's word. That's why you are not shaken. You are not moved because you have come to the true knowledge of God. How do I know when I go into a meeting whether it is God that is moving? How can I brush? How can I fine tune my discernments? Is by the knowledge of God. The more of him you know the more settled and matured you are even in the things of the spirit. So very quickly, as I close this morning, I want to give unto you seven signatures of God. Somebody is smiling and saying, it's not possible now. How can he say as he closes in 15 minutes? All right. Uh, seven signatures of God. Seven proofs. When you see this operational, you know this is God in that place. These are the everlasting signatures of God. It cannot change. It cannot be moved. You find it in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Because God is not a testament God. He is God of all ages. He's God of all ages. Uh, he's not a God of testament. He's the God of even of all ages. These are distinctive marks of God. Uh, number one, very quickly, what signature of God is that God's signature is grace. Every time you see God act or move, you see grace. When you see God do anything, he does it in grace. Grace alone. The clearest signature of God in all times, in all seasons is grace. He's the clearest signature of God. When you look at men God has used before, Moses, David, Samson, these were guys with problems, weaknesses, inadequacies, opposed to Paul. But one thing counted them out. One thing separated them, grace. Grace is that everlasting signature of God. Grace is what God will make that vision come true. It's not because you are prayed. It's not because you are worthy. It's the grace of God. Oh, that's what men found. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 14. The Bible says, I will behead him. He was full of grace 
and of truth. Full of grace and of truth. 16 of that same John chapter 1, Bible says of his fullness, have we all received even grace for grace. Carries and the carries. The Greek actually means grace being piled up even upon grace. And then verse 17 says, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to these folks. In the Old Testament, people found grace. They found grace. So grace is not just a New Testament phenomenon. It's the everlasting signature of God. Why? Because in the new, in the old, grace was there. Grace was speaking in the Old Testament. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and then verse 8 that Noah found grace with God. Oh, Noah found grace. Noah found grace. You can't find it except it's there. If I tell you to go to a supermarket and you will find something, you say, I found it. It's because it was there. So to find grace with God means that it was with him. It was with him. Little wonder, Exodus chapter 3 and then verse 13. Moses was praying, he said, if I found grace, uh, even in your sight, that you will go with us. Uh, that was his prayer. He said that you will go with us. If I found grace, uh, and Bible says that uh, God showed him his glory. Why? Because he has found grace. Uh, if you will find grace, God will see you. But let me say this to you. Good news is that in the New Testament, we don't find grace. Because to find means that it is not readily available. It's not always available. But in the New Testament, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Titus chapter 2 and then verse 11. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. If you will see God act, you will see grace at work. If you see a man used of God, you will see grace at work. You won't be able to explain their moves. You won't be able to explain that it was their effort that brought this great result. You will see grace. The tangibility of grace. The tangibility of grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8. The Bible said that the Lord of all grace. Oh! I tell people there, are, there is nothing. You know some people, they say, you know, he is not married, but he's rich. That means they are saying that he has grace for money, but he doesn't have grace for relationship. Are you following what I'm saying? They say, you know, he's, he's business smart, but he's not smart when it comes to making decisions, other decisions. They are saying there is grace for that, but he doesn't have grace for others. But the Bible says, the Lord God of all grace. That's who we serve. Second Corinthians chapter 9, then verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Talks about grace. What is grace? It is the person of Christ. It is God's supernatural provision for every need. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace. I was speaking to God one day. I said, God, I need a definition of grace. Not what people say. You know, people have had, this is not the first time you're hearing that grace is unmerited favor. Is that done or so? All right. I said, I need a definition. Then God said to me, He said, I said, grace is dash. So if you want the definition of grace, you can actually write that down and say, grace is, and then put dash. I mean, literal dash, just dash. The way they taught you dash in English. Don't put D-A-S-H, just put dash. I said, God, I don't understand. He said, because grace is everything you will ever need and everything you want. So grace is divine help. That's a correct definition. I can fill, the, fill in the dash and fill in the gap. I can say grace is breakthrough. I can say grace is unmerited favor. I can say grace is divine alignment. I can say grace is joy unspeakable. I can say grace is a counter. Grace is glory. And you know, as I'm saying all of those things, even in your spirit, you can't say those definitions are wrong. Because that's it. Grace is everything that Christ has and has given unto you. Grace is everything finished by Christ and done at Calvary. That's what grace is. Grace is God constantly filling up your account. You can't use it up. It's constantly filling up your account. That is grace. Grace, your grace, I'm nothing without you. Your grace, right on me. Listen, I, I, I like my story because I, I don't even know how some things happen. But I can tell you, 
And I, I'm going to share some stories and testimonies here. Not because it is important, but because like dear Moody's mother told her, that until you share your stories and practicals, you are not living the Bible. So I want to let you know that Bible is true. So one day somebody told me, how, how, how much does it take to, my, my, my father and the Lord asked me, say, how, how much does it take to get to South Africa? I said, I ah, know it's not expensive now. You, uh, you, and then you go to VSF and all of that. And then he said, okay, then go and do it. Now listen, this is not where the story is. And then I got there and then they said I should preach in our church uh, in Pretoria. And um, I was preaching to Botswana, Malawi, people from everywhere. And I was like, ah, so you have become an international preacher like this. And, and, and as I began to share the word, I, of course, what, what did I preach about? I preached on grace. Because I was not standing here based on anything. I came because grace made it possible. I mean, I, I remember I chatted him and I said, I want to go back to Nigeria. I'm tired. I want to go back. He said, that's the money finished. I said, yes, that's finished. And then he sent me more money. I mean, dollars. He sent me more money. And I, I remember when I was coming back to Nigeria, I had bags of loads of things. Why? I, because I, I didn't pay a penny. I, I didn't pay a penny. And um, I preached on grace. Now, I remember I preached grace, grace, all grace. That's one of, if you have never listened to that sermon, that's one of those messages that are life messages. I, I remember when I finished that sermon, I sat down and the pastor took that, pastor, took the microphone, Pastor Gospel, and he said something. He said, you know, this man that is preaching on grace, he really knows what he's talking about. And, and, and he said, you know, our, our church, our church has never given anybody an holiday and a vacation to go to Ekwe before. He was saying it. He, he said, he said we, we have never, I have not heard that anybody went to Badakri based on the finances that. He said, but a man that they will call a man and send him all expense paid and say he should go to South Africa and go and rest. He said he has never, he, he said it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the nature of my boss. He doesn't do that. We are not supposed to rest on the earth. He said that he's here. This is, so he knows what he's talking about. You know, if, if you begin to see the traces of things you did not merit, when God begin to single you out out of others, sir, when you see your experience and you look at your lineage and you cannot place it, sir, then you are saying, listen, there is a sign. God has signed over my life. Sir. There is a signature over my life because my story cannot be spoken by processes. When they ask you, how did you get here? And then you say what you said. And they did what you said. And they did not come to the same result then there is a tangibility upon your life uh, that is not upon their life. Uh, there is an extra that is called grace, which is God in your race. Uh, there is a God in your race uh, that makes your race uh, pan out differently than theirs. Grace. You came to Lagos the way they came. But look at your life. Are you the only entrepreneur? You have people booking you. You have people wanting to see you more than others. Look at that. It's just grace. Grace. The first signature of God. Proven. Proven anywhere. And you know why I said it is the signature of God? The devil cannot scam it. The devil does not have grace. It will destroy you. It doesn't, what is unmerited? Even the unmerited destruction, it will overdo it. This is the only thing that God alone can give. The second signature of God is love. Love is not a feeling. Can I speak to somebody? I feel, I feel good. I, I, the way, when he calls me, I just feel so good. Love is not a feeling. I can prove it to you. This is not your first relationship. It's about your thought. When the first guy called you, that was the way you felt too. Second one, that's the way you felt. So you can't base it on feeling because feeling comes and feeling goes. Love is not a thought. Love is not even in definition. So if you are waiting for a definition, you won't have one this morning. Love is an act. Love is what you do. Love is not what you say. And I can prove that to you. If somebody calls you sweetheart and say, you know what, I love you. I love you. I love you so much. I love you so much. And on your birthday, he didn't show up with anything. He didn't even send you a text message because that's an act. He didn't send you anything. He didn't send you a text message. He didn't do anything. Uh, and even when you had that breakthrough, a major promotion, the guy did not, you send him a message to inform me, he didn't call you. 
He didn't do anything. And then four days later, he's in Lina and said, will you marry me? You'll be a fool to marry that kind of person. Why? Because his words are not his act. His words are not his act. Somebody say, I love you, sweetheart. I love you. I, I, and he does not call you on a regular basis. He calls you twice in a week. And then sometimes once in a month. And sometimes he says, I'm busy. You know, I'm busy. You see, when they start telling you they are busy, they are lying. Because they hit. If you can hit, you can call. If you can hit, you can send text message. So when they start saying that, it means there's no commitment. It means there's no full persuasion. So you can't do that. Love, the tangibility of that, not that word, the tangibility of love is in action. The tangibility of it. What you can see, what you can process. Tangibility is in action. Is in action. And I'll prove it to you fair scriptures. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world. What did he do? He gave. If he loved us and he was just saying it. it not that, no. He loved us and he gave. First John chapter 4 verse 10. Not that we first love him but that he first loved us. And gave his son. Made his son the very propitiation for our sins. It was love that made him make his son the price for our sins. Love. 15, 13 John. The Bible says there's no greater love than this. Than a man should lay down his life for a friend. Some of you say, I don't know whether that guy loves you. You can know. Not until you see, I'm, I, I, I'm your God. I'm your. You can know. He's always there, always talking to you. You say, I don't know I'm in love. You are in love. In fact, love has taken you over. So, by the act, I suppose, you understand that it is tangible. What is he doing? What does God do? And I remember many years ago, I had this conversation with God. When he gave me this definition. And I began to say to God, I can't, I can't tell people this. You need to prove it to me from scriptures. And then he said, you remember my son? I, I, said, I said, what sir? He said, you remember that I said that Jacob, have I loved this or have I hated? I said, oh, I remember. He said, look at their life. I said, I don't even like that kind of love. Did you read scriptures? Esau was richer. Esau had more, com has more peace. He was when 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 Jacob came back, he said, no, did, "What do I do with this, my my brother? I'm already I'm, I already have enough." He was, so if it was the time, if it was resources, material things, no, that's not the blessing. That's not the love of God. I said, "Okay, so God, I, I know I've spoken a lot. Well, what are you saying?" He said, "I, I want to sell you my love. If because I love him, I was active in his life." You see, when God loves you, he will be active in your life. Look at the life of Jacob. He had an encounter with God. He saw the ladder from hope coming down. God spoke to him, gave him an idea for a business. God called him and told him it is time to return home. God was always, always speaking to him. He didn't speak a word to Esau. A proof of love was the activity of God in his life. Is God active in your life? Does it speak to you? That's a signature. It's a signature that God is with you. Oh, you may not have money in your account, but there is a signature. The God signature. It's indelible. I said, God, that's the one. The Bible says, out of two or three witnesses, the truth shall be established. And the second one. And you know what God said to me? He said, and I kept giving excuses for him. Love give excuses. Look at Jacob. If Jacob had come inside and said he wants to marry your, uh, your daughter, would you have given Jacob? He was even called a supplanter. But God did not say all of those things. If the scripture we explain it away, the scripture will say it was his art, it was his passion. Excuses. Do you know that when you love somebody, you give excuses for them? I think that girl is big. No, <laughs> can't you see her shape? You want her? She has body, <laughs> but that's what I like. <laughs> they tell you that she, the way she talks, ah, no, she speaks well. She no, I think she's fake. Her phonetic, no, that is even what I love. That's even what I love. So the act of love is that love gives excuses. It doesn't see the fault. It begins to explain why the person is actually behaving bad. That's why some people come to you and say, I know, I know, I know you actually say that. I know you will support them. 
I will support them because that's what love does. <laughs> love just supports and love will not see wrong easily. So God does not look at you and say, you did not pray yesterday, I'm angry with you. He actually told you, he said to himself that he's tired. <laughs> Even though you are telling yourself, or oh, letting me, God was saying you are tired. Don't make it an act. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm merely telling you that that's what God does. It's the signature of God. Therefore, if you see a prophetic meeting, do you see love in the atmosphere? How can there be healings and miracles without love? How can there be healings and miracles without unity? How can you talk to the brethren the way you just want to talk to them? You say things and derogate them and people are saying that is God moving. No, God is a God of love. He is a God of love. Number three, very quickly. Number three. God's signature is mercy. Mercy means to be kind, to be favorable, to be compassionate. The key point in mercy is the desire to help. So mercy is not, um, is not sympathy. It's not pity. It is empathy. The, the separating point there is that with mercy... There is a willingness to help. When you have mercy on somebody, you look at what they are going through and you are thinking, what can I do to help them? What can I do to ameliorate their pain? What can I do to alleviate even their suffering? That's what you are thinking. Not that you say sorry and then you return to watching Manchester United or Chelsea. That's not how it works. You want to do something even to help them. The Bible says in 89, 14 of the book of Psalms, the Bible says grace and mercy, no, mercy and truth proceed before him. Therefore, when you see God, in front of God every time, is mercy and truth. Mercy and truth. Very important, mercy and truth. Mercy is the benevolence and tenderness of God that makes him treat an offender better than he deserves. Better than he deserves. God is not saying you are not at fault. God is saying, but I will have mercy on you. No, let's, let's speak truth. Do you believe that if God had done you the way, what you have done, if you have reaped the reward, do you think you'll be where you are today? I thought you said God does not do anything in your life. I thought you said God does not speak to you. But these are the signatures of God. I see it all over you. Look at him and say, I see it all over you. Mercy is so essential with God. You know that the Bible records that Jesus did many miracles because he had compassion on the people. He had mercy on them. So it was the mercy of God that actually made him to do it. Look at the leper. Look at the lepers. They said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon us. And Jesus had mercy on them. Mercy. Listen to this. For you to reach God, it is faith. But for God to reach you, it is mercy. For you to reach God, it is faith. The key is faith. But for him to reach you, it is mercy. You know why? Because he's your creator. He's a big God. He's a great God. So for him to actually dwell and dine and speak to you, that's mercy. That's why the Yoruba say, Anoni Moriba. It's mercy. It's the mercy of God. I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. I can't do this thing by myself. Mercy. If you remove from God mercy, you have removed his ability to communicate with men. If you remove from God mercy, you have removed his ability to communicate, to have koinonia, to have fellowship with man. Every time you said God spoke to me this morning, you encounter mercy that morning. Every time uh, in your little space, in your little room uh, where you have devotional and God said that vision will come true. Just a reminder that that vision will come true. You encountered mercy that morning. Mercy. Do you understand that the key to experiencing God's mercy, like I shared in the midweek service, is mercy. The key to experience mercy is mercy. Matthew chapter 5 verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Therefore, God's signature should not only be with God, every believer should carry this signature. You should be gracious. You should be loving. And you should be merciful on people. You can't look at what they are going through 
I say, I pray for you. James said, your faith is of nothing. You should do something about it. Everywhere you see mercy operational, you see God operational. Give me the next slide. You see a man there. I want to talk about this man, this young man. That's Stephen McDonald. Now, Stephen, Stephen McDonald was a patrolman in the U.S. Now, a young man who was probably drunk on something just carried a gun and shot him. I shot the guy. And he was permanently paralyzed. They asked him. And they asked him and said, you know what? The law is there. It's time to seek revenge. Oh, you do. And he said, no, I'm not going to seek revenge. I'm not going to do anything. I don't want it. I don't want revenge. I just want healing and I just want to go through my life. Look at what he said. He said, I forgave him because I believe the only thing was that receiving a bullet in my spine would have been to nurture revenge in my heart. The only thing was that receiving a bullet in my spine would have been to nurture revenge in my heart. It was mercy that was speaking. Can I ask you those who have hurt you? You know, that's the thing about bearing the signature of God. Now you have seen the sign. You also can sign. Are you operating with mercy with people? Are you forgiving? Some of us, we are as bitter as the definition of bitterness. The thing we are carrying around is so bad. Bitterness is like taking poison and expecting someone else to die. Don't be witchcraft be that. To take poison and expect someone else will die. But that's what bitterness does to you. It's slow poison. It kills you. It destroys you. You must let mercy shine on it. You must let mercy shine on it. You must let mercy shine on it. God's signature again is faith. Anywhere you see God operational, you see faith operation. I can look at this, my brother. I say, you will be great. Your future is bright. Oh, I see grace upon your head. I see glory rising upon you. And then he comes and says, did you hear anything? I didn't have to hear anything. I'm just proclaiming in faith. Faith speaks. Faith is in action. Prophecy is about speaking words. First Corinthians, First Corinthians 14 and then verse 3. He will prophesize. Speak comfort, edification, and exhortation to people. So as I'm speaking and praying, you often feel good. You feel comforted. You feel edified. And you know what? I'm actually signing like God because that's how God operates. Everything God ever does, he does by faith. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, and God said. Genesis chapter 1 verse 6, and God said. Genesis chapter 1 verse 9, and God said. 1 11, and God said. 1 14, and God said. 24, 27, and God said. What he said was the reality that became. The signature of God and that's how I know that that your vision will come true. The vision of a home, the vision of a business, it will come true because the same God that said and it became is the same God that said it over your life. Faith. 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 It caused the things that be not as though they were. How many creative thinkers are here? How many strategists are here? How many business moguls are here? How many philanthropists are here? How many CEOs, millionaires are here? If you are here, say, I'm here. I'm here. Say, I'm here. I'm here. And some of us, I can't hear you. Say, I'm here. I'm here. Oh. Faith is the currency of heaven. What grace makes available, faith makes applicable. It's available by grace, but what applies it in your life is faith. Faith. And God is the God of faith and not of sight. He is the God of faith. You may not look like it. And he called Peter. He said, Peter, you are a rock. At that time, he was a reed. So that I am not surprised that he is telling you that you are going to build six towers. <laughs> Those who he told it to before did not believe it. I read the story of Hora Robert. How the day he got born again, 
months later after the Lord healed him, the Lord said he's going to build a university for him. You don't understand. He was born in Tulsa. His father were very poor. His, his parents were poor. They were preachers. You know all those old preachers? Having food and raiment, you must rejoice. Glory to God. And God was speaking and said, you will build a university for me. Today, who are you stand as an evidence that God is faithful? If you look at where you are right now, you may not look like it. If you look at where you are, you may not look like it. But this is just a part of the story. God does not call you by where you are in your story. God tells you, calls you by the involving of your story. He sees the end and he knows the end. He's the God that calls the things that be not as though they were. It doesn't matter where you are. I know the God of things. And because he's in your journey and he's in your story, it's going to pan out exactly the way he said it. What is the hope of the believer? Which are the God of faith. I've got a signature of God in my life and it is a proof of faith. And that's what it takes also to, to, to live with men. You've got to believe the best when people. You've got to have faith in people's ability. Number five. God's signature again is given. It's given. Now what is the best thing you have ever given out? Can I ask you? What's the best thing you've ever given out? Think about it. Have you ever given out a car? Not yet. Praise God. Amen. I believe that. I believe that. But what's the best thing you've ever given now? Now, 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 now. Wristwatch. A phone. A laptop. Mine would be maybe a laptop. Maybe shoes. I don't know. Cash. Cash. Especially when dollars. Burns. But you know the signature of God? The Bible says in 832 Romans, He gave His Son, and how shall He not together with Him give you all things to enjoy? God is a giver. It is not that your prayers is going to bamboozle God. It's not too much for Him to do. Why? Because He has given the best. The ones you are asking for now are not His best. Do you understand what that means? He has given his best so that you asking for a wife, a husband, asking for a child, asking for a baby is not the best. He has given the best. How will he not together give you all things to enjoy? I love that verse. He said, give us all things to enjoy. So it's not, enjoyment is in scriptures. It's not to suffer. He said, give you all things to enjoy. Grace is given so that you can bask in the, in the glory of God. Is so that you can enjoy the glory of his presence. Because signature is given. James chapter 1 verse 5. Do anyone lack wisdom? Let him ask from God. Who give unto all liberally. Liberally. You know there are people that um, their, their hand is like um, the horse in front of National Theater. Uh, have you seen that horse before? It's always like this. It, that horse never opens. It's like the horse in front of National Theater. Is that? God's hand is forever open. God's hand is forever open. Listen to this. We must be a people that give. You know, the point about being stingy is that you also have closed your hands so that you can also not receive. Because when your hand is like this, nobody gives you anything also. Though what is yours is yours. Amen. Uh, you get all you can, can all you can, and then you have sat on the can. But the problem with sitting on that can is that you can also not move to go and receive more cans. Paul told the Corinthians, you have abound in all gifts, but ensure you are bound in this gift also, the gift of giving. Ensure you do that. Ransom house, we must be a church that gives. Are you following what I'm saying? We must be a church that sees needs and meets them. So that you, you see somebody come to church and instead of gathering and say, ah, oh, that guy, that guy that wears black shoe. You know that's what we do in church sometimes. Say, ah. When we're trying to describe somebody, we are doing innocently. Say, ah, you don't know that guy that used to wear white shirts. Because white shirt is all here. So if you know that that is, is the guy that always wears the white shirt, why can't you buy him a pink shirt? At least now we can begin to say the guy that wears the white and the pink shirt. 
You know why people say they don't give because they are poor? It's a lie. If you don't give, it's because you are stingy. It has nothing to do with poverty. Because where you are in life is somebody else's testimony. Where you are in life is somebody else's prayers. What you have is somebody else's prayers. Every year, I, I schedule my wardrobe every year. If I did not wear anything in six months or a year, then I don't need it. And I've discovered that what you are barely using is what somebody else needs to even get a good job. To appear good and cool. Listen, we must be a church that gives. I saw a testimony of a church who when they were starting out had a music minister who was very dedicated. I mean, she was always there singing. And the pastor said, one day we will reward you. You know how we pastors speak now. One day we will reward. It doesn't mean we will reward you. You know, I mean, people have learned by experience that pastors <laughs> just coping us. But this day, the lady came to church many years later and the pastor called her house and gave her a key to a car and said, I told you, I told you, I remember how, how you would come trekking even when it doesn't look like this vision will live. He said, here's our reward. She and her husband, they just got married. The Baba was crying. I said, Baba, it was not your harvest. Though. I hope you know. It's not your harvest. So it's not your car. It's not your harvest. But he married right. Have you? <laughs> he married right. But what am I trying to say? I know a lot of people who get convicted, who got convicted because of that act. That act. There's a lot you can do. There's a lot you can give. Wearing seven sunglasses does not mean anything. It doesn't mean that light will not shine on you. Amen. Number six. I said seven. Number six. God's signature is faithfulness. You know, one of the things about God is that God keeps his word. Even if you can't keep yours, he keeps his word. Isaiah 55 verse 10, the Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. So it means that even now, if you're asking me what is God doing, I'm telling you that he's watching over his word. And somebody said, is he watching over the Bible? No! The personal word he gave everyone on the earth, God is watching over his for a performance. That's what God is doing. In your life, God is watching. That I call this person a prophetic intercession. He's watching over his. He's watching over his. What's he doing? For a performance. For a performance. And that's what you believe about God. God says it, he will do it. If you said it, you will. You're a man of your word. Just understand the tone. You know the song. Let's continue. No matter how long the promises of God are, it will come to pass. Can I have an amen? It will come to pass. And God kind of drilled this to me in July 2006. Ask your neighbor, who are you in July 2006? Oh, we are pretty young. That when you are greeting me, you know how you are greeting me. Amen. July 2006, he called to me and we're in a fellowship. And God said, and I will never forget, God said he was coming. Ah. God prophesied that he was coming. And we kind of just believed it, that he was coming. So we went to fellowship the next day and we're waiting for the arrival of God. The fellowship was supposed to end around 8. By 15 minutes to 8, we were still praying in the spirit and God had not come. But we stayed there. At about 8.30, there was an holy pandemium. God came. I think we ended that meeting 11 on something. We could not even share the grace. And I knew from that day that you can count on God's word. If he said he's coming, he's coming. If he said you will get there, you will get there. If he said he will buy you a car, go and learn how to drive. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it might not come the year you thought it will come or the day you thought it will come but of a certainty God is coming at the right time in the set time it's going to happen for you so whatever it is God has said relax he's faithful 
Look at your neighbor and say, I've got news for you. If I'm preaching like that, who would have left? I, I believe you can preach better. Look at your neighbor and say, I've got news for you. God can be counted upon. God can be counted upon. How many times will I drill this to you in ransom now? That God can be counted upon. Look at your vision book. Every time you think there are doubts, God can be counted upon. Every time it seems like it's not going to work, God can be counted upon. Your mom called you and said, when is your husband coming? Look at her and drop that phone. Look up to God and say, God can be counted upon. They ask you, when will you change your job? Are you not tired of this 40K in, on the highland? Look at them and say, I know for certain. God can be counted upon. It may tarry, but it will come to pass. He that will come will come. Though he tarries, I'm going to wait for him. I know that my tomorrow speak of getter things. Oh, the glory of the latter house, it shall surpass even that of the former. Though your beginning be small, yet your latter end should greatly increase. For the path of the righteous is like a shining light. It shines more and more even unto the perfect day. I know who is for me. Who is for me is the maker of the heavens and the earth. He is the word who speaks and does not repent. For I know out of two immutable things of which it is impossible even for God to lie. What he says is his word. His word is his oath. His oath is his bill. What he has said concerning me, it will come to pass. That's an able answer. Like you are living, because you are living in the reality of it. You see, when you, the, way, the way your face was so hard when you came into service, it was because you were doubting the tangibility of the promises of God. A privilege that you are in ransom house today. What a privilege. That you saw us at this beginning. Because a day would come and you say, I was there. Who do they want to interview? He said, come and interview me. I'll tell you the story. I'll tell you the story. I'll tell you the story. Why? Because he that will come, will come. He that has promised, uh, his law is his bound. Uh, he's bound by his word. Uh, somebody said, did he give you a hold? I said, I don't need a hold. Bible says because he could swore by no grave, he swore by himself. He swore by himself. Then in blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply you. Dust. Are you seeing dust? Dust. Every time you see dust, you must remember God's faithfulness. When you see, God told me, He said, Look up. Can you see the stars? If you can count them. That's why sometimes when I'm talking to people, I'm already thinking, can this one pastor in the UK? Can this one pastor in the US? Can this one pastor in Canada? Oh, we are not mad. We are mad on something else. Do you know why? We are not saying we are not mad. It's your definition of mad that is or incorrect, sir. That's not correct. Understand that we are actually making a difference. That's what mad is actually making a difference. Uh, with God on our side, we are making the difference. Uh, with God on our side, we are able to take the country. We are saying to you and to everyone uh, that this portion is too small. We want greater. We want more. Because God is faithful. His signature is his faithfulness. Thank you for listening. This has been The Living Word. If you have been blessed by this teaching or for counseling or any other inquiry, kindly send us an email to pfa at the ransomedhouse.com or fisayoadenii at yahoo.com or please call 0912-772-3824. The Ransomed House, empowering people to live for Jesus.